And hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our ASIC seminar series. And today we are thrilled to have Professor Richard Walker with us. Professor Walker is a professor and the current chair of Department of Geology and the University of Maryland. He received a BS in Geology from College of William and Mary and Master and PhD in Geology from Stony Brook University. He did post work and the U.S. National Bureau of Standards, the College Institution of Washington Department of um, Terrestrial Magnetism and the U.S. Geological Survey. He joined the University of Maryland in 1990. Um, Professor Walker utilized uh, radiogenic isotopes and trace elements to conduct research in several areas of cosmochemistry and geochemistry, uh, including the nature and timing of um, processes that occurred within the first few million years of solar system formation, and how the Earth's core, mantle, and crust have interacted over the 4.5 billion year history of the planet. Professor Walker was the 1990 recipient of the Clark Medal um, of the Geochemical Society and the 2019 Hess Medal of the American Geophysical Union. He's a fellow of American Geophysical Union, a fellow of the European Association for Geochemistry and the Geochemical Society. He's also a distinguished university professor at, here at the University of Maryland. Let's welcome Professor Walker. Thanks. So um, I, I do keep track of the titles of the talks that are given here on a weekly basis. And this one's going to be a, uh, and now for something completely different type of talk. Um, so I'm going to be talking. Uh, mostly about solid earth processes, and uh, feel free to ask questions as we go. So I'm gonna be talking uh, primarily about uh, so-called short-lived radiogenic isotope systems. Uh, we use those uh, quite frequently with regard to processes occurring at the surface of the earth today, but I'm gonna be dealing with uh, systems that uh, have uh, really uh, modified very slightly the isotopic compositions of uh, portions of the interior of the Earth uh, really within the early part of solar system history and follow through to today. But before I get on to short-lived systems, I want to uh, first uh, kind of uh, get you coordinated or acclimated with something that you might in the distant past have been exposed to, and that's a long-lived radiogenic isotope system. And so the system that I chose to present to you as a long-lived radiogenic isotope system is the Samarium-147 uh, neodymium-143 system. And this is an alpha decay process. And I just want to point out the uh, half-life for Samarium-147 is about 100 billion years. So this is a very slow decaying system, and this system can be used for geochronology of very old rocks. It can be used for not-so-old rocks as well. Um, what we normally do with long-lived, and it'll be true for short-lived systems as well, is we ratio the radiogenic daughter product to a stable isotope of the daughter element. In this case, that would be neodymium-144. And uh, variations in the parent-daughter ratio in different planetary domains governs the evolution of that isotopic composition through time. And so this is just a textbook view of how the neodymium-143-144 ratio of some different uh, planetary materials might change with time. The uh, thing that's, the line that's labeled CHUR stands for chondritic uniform reservoir. That's essentially how primitive or chondritic meteorites would evolve, essentially from the time at the start of the solar system to today. If you have a planet that has a broadly chondritic composition, you melt it, you might produce some melts that go on to form something like continental crust on this planet. They may evolve along a very different trajectory. 
and the stuff that's left behind from what was melted must evolve in a complementary direction opposite to the direction that the, the melt um, ultimately evolves. So we use long-lived radiogenic isotope systems not just then for geochronology, but for tracing processes that occurred long ago in planetary history, including this planet, and um, use that to place some constraints on what those processes were. Um, so, this is um, what is uh, commonly called the Mantle Zoo. I guess, um, maybe did I go past one? There we go. So, if you look at uh, isotopic composi compositions of long-lived radiogenic isotope systems, different places where melts get to the surface from the mantle of the Earth, you see arrays that look like this. So on the left is a plot of uh, strontium-8786. This is a system that's associated with the decay of rubidium-87. The vertical scale here is neodymium. It's in epsilon terminology, but it's just what I showed you before, essentially 143-144 ratio. And all the dots on the left-hand side are the isotopic compositions of the salts that are found at places where uh, there are spreading centers on this planet, mid-ocean ridge spreading centers. So these are all data for mid-ocean ridge uh, basalts. The figure on the right, same isotopes, slightly different scale, represent the isotopic compositions of what uh, many geochemists view as uh, fundamentally different reservoirs within the mantle. And these are all data on the right-hand side from ocean island basalt systems. Ocean island basalts here you should treat as being synonymous with maybe what you were taught in the past, hot spot volcanic systems like Hawaii and Iceland and Samoa. The thing to note is the mantle is not isotopically homogeneous. The variations require long-term variations in parent-daughter ratios for both of the isotope systems that are shown here. Okay, so uh, it can get even more complicated. This uh, tetrahedron is uh, an attempt to show isotopic variation among different uh, mantle reservoirs uh, in four different isotope systems, samarium neodymium, rubidium strontium, and uranium lead. And uh, the ends of this uh, tetrahedron have labels. Uh, EM1 stands for Enriched Mantle 1, EM2 stands for Enriched Mantle 2, high mu refers to a portion of the mantle that evidently had a high uranium to lead ratio for a long period of time, and DMM stands for Depleted Moore Mantle, it's the composition that is uh, kind of the average of mid-ocean ridge basalts. So all of the isotopic variability in here is a result, as I mentioned, of long-term variations in the parent-daughter ratios. And these end members have been referred to in the past as the uh, mantle zoo. And if you look at this figure carefully, you may recognize some of the names. So some of the names are like Hawaii, an ocean island basalt system. Uh, Pitcairn is an ocean island basalt. Um, Mangaya, Samoa, Tristan, these are all island systems that are far removed from mid-ocean ridge spreading centers. The only uh, example of an ocean island basalt system that intersects also with a mid-ocean ridge spreading center is Iceland. Okay, so basically this mantle zoo consists of pleasant looking animals, animals that you know we're all now familiar with. Isotope geochemists have been dealing with these isotopic heterogeneities for 40 years. People are pretty comfortable with them and uh, have a variety of uh, relatively consistent interpretations for why the, the isotopic compositions of these materials vary. 
We're now going to move on to short-lived systems, which is really the focus of my talk. And short-lived systems we're kind of at the beginning of, and so we're not really sure what sort of creatures we're going to encounter with uh, the short-lived systems. And so I'm going to try to give you a flavor of uh, what we can do with short-lived systems and where we're headed with short-lived systems. And so I'm going to be using the term anomaly here. An isotopic anomaly refers to an isotopic composition that includes the decay product of a short-lived isotope. And uh, it has an isotopic composition. A material has an isotopic composition that varies from that of the standards that we use in the lab when making the measurements with mass spectrometers. And in all the cases I'll be referring to, differ from your isotopic composition. So if we were to grind you up and analyze you for these isotopic compositions, you would have the same isotopic composition as the standards that we use in the lab, but we're going to be looking at some materials that have a different isotopic composition. The key things to note with regard to this talk are that isotopic anomalies that uh, we're going to be talking about were all created within the first 50 to 500 million years of solar system history. So I'm going to be talking most, uh, most of the talk about tungsten isotopes and all of the tungsten isotopic variations that we'll be talking about occurred within the first 50 million years of solar system history. The second system that I'll be talking about, neodymium-142, a different neodymium isotope from what I just showed you, all occurred within the first 500 million years of solar system history. So we're going to be looking at things that essentially went extinct 50 and 500 million years into solar system history. And so the fact that uh, we can find uh, examples of isotopic anomalies in geological materials means that at the very least, these anomalies are recording aspects of uh, Earth's earliest differentiation and perhaps accretionary histories, and somehow they got preserved and incorporated in the rock record. So these are just some basic questions for short-lived systems. They are, did the Earth or its building blocks lose early crust as a result of collisions or as a result of mantle overturn? Did the Earth undergo one or more magma ocean events? So you might have heard of the current favored hypothesis for the origin of the moon, where the moon formed as a result of the proto-Earth being struck by a Mars-sized body. That almost certainly would have melted all, if not a significant portion of the Earth. Do we have any evidence for that in uh, short-lived systems? Go ahead. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, what's, what's the correlation mm -hmm. between magma ocean events and All of the rocks that I'll be showing you formed data for. All of them formed after the uh, isotopic systems that I'll be talking about went extinct. So somehow they had to have been preserved somewhere inside the Earth such that that region of the mantle, for example, could have melted and produced the rocks that uh, become part of the rock record that we can go out and sample. And then uh, finally, how long did anomalies that were created during this early period of time survive? Which brings us to the spoiler alert. Some of the primordial heterogeneities that were created very early in Earth history survive to this day. Not only in old rocks, but we're going to see in young rocks as well. And so what we're going to try to do with the rest of this talk is see what the preservation of some of these short-lived uh, system anomalies tell us about the current structure of the Earth. Okay. So I'm going to talk about two short-lived systems. I'm not going to spend much time on this one, but hopefully you'll see why it is important in the interpretation of the second one. So this looks kind of like the system that I showed you earlier. It consists of two rare earth elements, samarium and neodymium. But these are actually two different isotopes from what I mentioned before. This is samarium-146. It decays to neodymium-142. And this system has a half-life not of 100 billion years, but of 100 million years. 
So this system, the rule of thumb after about five half-lives, the system has decayed away. This system was active during the first approximately 500 million years of solar system history. And so it is a system that is uh, perturbed geochemically by processes that occur in silicate systems. These are two elements that are cited exclusively in the silicate portion of the Earth. And so any variations that we see in the neodymium-142 composition of rocks must have happened as a consequence of some sort of silicate process during the first 500 million years of solar system history. I'm going to be referring to isotopic deviations or anomalies in terms of mu units. So a mu-142 neodymium is uh, the part per million variation or difference in isotopic composition from that of standards. And so that means we're talking about very small differences in the order of the sixth and seventh significant figure of the ratios. So very, very small differences. And that makes me want to tell you these are very difficult uh, measurements to make because the deviations in isotopic ratios are really small. And in the 1990s, there was a lot of discussion about whether or not we could actually measure uh, isotopic anomalies in terrestrial rocks. We had some bigger effects in some extraterrestrial rocks like lunar rocks, but there was a question of whether or not anomalies really could be found in terrestrial rocks. And these are just uh, two figures from papers that came out in the 1990s. This paper argued that you could see anomalies in some ancient uh, earth rocks from Greenland. Uh, this paper looked at the same materials and concluded that you couldn't, that uh, the uncertainties and the analytical um, issues of the time made it so you couldn't definitively argue that there were isotopic differences. The good news is, about the uh, turn of the century, a new uh, generation of mass spectrometers came along and gave us the resolution to really clearly resolve uh, some anomalies in the rock record. And so this is a figure from a 2003 paper. These are all data from uh, what are called EOR Kean rocks. They're rocks that are about 3.6 to 3.9 billion years old. Uh, and this is the standard that uh, a lot of people use, and these are some mid-ocean ridge basalts. And I think you can see that there's a clear offset of, uh, in this case, about 15 parts per million. So since the early 2000s, we have been able to resolve isotopic differences for this system in terrestrial rocks. And this is a compilation from now seven years ago, and it shows some interesting stuff. The vertical scale here is mu one 42 neodymium, so the part per million deviation from standards in the isotopic composition measured for the rock. And the x-axis is time in billion years. So this is the start of the solar system 4.5 something billion years ago. You're down here at zero. You can see in neodymium 142 space, there's a lot of both positive and negative anomalies. Most of these are associated with these Greenland rocks that are, again, 3.7, 3.8 billion years old. Uh, not a whole lot of work has been done on any rocks during the Proterozoic. Um, most people assume that the isotopic composition of 142 attenuated down to the present day composition of the silicate Earth. And so it's presumed that this is a result of a convective stirring of the mantle during the Archean, such that we don't have any real isotopic heterogeneity in this system today. Okay. Uh, last thing I'll mention about neodymium-142 is to get these isotopic compositions at 3.7 or 3.8 required some sort of a change in the parent-daughter ratio much earlier than 3.8. This system was dead by 3.8 billion years ago. And these are just some figures from uh, that 2012 paper showing that to get an uh, increase in this uh, mu-142 value, you don't have to pay much attention to this other than the fact that it requires a shift in the parent-daughter ratio very close to 4.5 billion years ago. 
So to get the isotopic compositions that we see in these significantly younger rocks, but still very old rocks, you have to have some event that occurs really, really early in Earth history, probably well within the first 100 million years of planetary um, evolution. And it's presumed this is uh, an example. The positive and negative anomalies are the result of some sort of major magma ocean processes. Okay. So this brings me to the main topic of this talk, which is what we're actively working on over in our laboratory, and that is the hafnium tungsten isotope system. And this is a geologically interesting system. It's a cosmochemically interesting system because hafnium is what is termed a lithophile trace element. It stays exclusively in the silicate shell of any planetary body. Tungsten is what is known as a siderophile element. So it prefers to go into metal phases. And so about 90% of Earth's tungsten is sitting in the core right now. There are other elements that are even more siderophile than tungsten. An element like gold is highly siderophile, and about 98% of all of Earth's gold is sitting in the core 2,900 kilometers beneath your feet. You've, you've got 10% of Earth's tungsten here with you in the silicate shell of the Earth. This is a system that has a half-life of only about 9 million years. So this is a system that uh, went extinct about 50 million years into solar system history. So on a planetary scale, like uh, this cartoon sketch, most of the planet's tungsten goes into the core. All of the hafnium stays in the silicate shell, in this case the uh, sickly green color. And that means that the silicate shell of the Earth and the silicate shell of other planetary bodies has a pretty high hafnium tungsten ratio relative to the bulk composition of the planet. And the core has a really, really low hafnium tungsten ratio because it has no hafnium in it. And so if planetary cores separate from the silicate portion of the body while hafnium-182 is still alive, there will be an isotopic contrast between the silicate shell and the core. And as it turns out, the isotopic composition of you and me, tungsten light bulbs, and most rocks that we can find on the surface of the Earth is very different from what we believe the bulk composition of the Earth to be. We define our composition in this uh, mu terminology, again, I'm using that for tungsten, as being zero because we're very self-centered. And if you accept that the bulk composition of the Earth is roughly similar to that of chondritic meteorites, undifferentiated meteorites, then the core of the Earth must have a mu value of about minus 220. The other thing to remember about this system is about 10% of Earth's tungsten is here with us in the silicate shell of the Earth. And in the silicate shell of the Earth, it behaves as what we in the geochemical world refer to as a highly incompatible trace element. It doesn't like to go into silicates much. And so crystal liquid fractionation tends to concentrate it in the liquid. It has a very similar, the hafnium tungsten system in the silicate shell of this planet behaves very similarly to that of half, uh, to samarium neodymium. So the parent daughter ratios change as a result of the same types of processes in the same directions to roughly the same orders of magnitude for these two short-lived systems. And that means that uh, if silicate fractionation, such as a magma ocean process, is involved in the generation of these anomalies, we should see a positive correlation between neodymium-142 and tungsten 182, meaning if you have a positive anomaly in 142, you should have a positive anomaly in tungsten 182. If you see a negative anomaly in 142, you would expect to see a negative anomaly in the tungsten isotope system as well. Okay? Any questions about that? Because now we're ready to plug ahead with some real data. Ah. This just shows uh, what we believe the concentrations to be. Just this, I just put this in here to convince you that uh, 
Overall, the Earth probably has a composition like this, and overall, the Earth probably has a mu value of about minus 190 or minus 200. You have a composition along with the rest of the silicate Earth of zero, and uh, the core by mass balance about minus 220. Okay, so I'm going to show you some data for some early Earth rocks, but then I'm going to transition pretty quickly to modern rocks. This is a compilation of all of the published high precision data for uh, tungsten 182. Uh, and these are from the primary locations on Earth where we find the oldest rocks. So Issawa, Greenland, they're as old as about 4 billion years. Uh, Nuvojatuk, Acasta, and Saglik, those are all Canadian locales. Pilbara is in Australia. So the thing to notice here is that uh, all of the samples that have been analyzed and for which data have been published, almost all of them are characterized by positive anomalies. And uh, the one place where we have corresponding neodymium-142 data don't really show any correlation between neodymium-142 and tungsten-182. So if you were hoping for proof positive of a magma ocean, some sort of silicate fractionation event, this does not provide it. So uh, I'll just take uh, one interpretation for this just to give you a flavor of the types of information that this might be providing us with. Uh, the first paper that published data of this type was uh, this paper by Vilbold et al. in uh, 2011 in Nature. And they noticed uh, with these data that there was about a plus 13 part per million positive uh, deviation in these early earth rocks from uh, that of modern rocks. And they interpreted this to be a result of uh, a process called late accretion. And late accretion is normally defined as continued accretion of a planetary body after core formation has ceased. So the idea here is as a planet grows, core material metal is constantly falling through the silicate shell sucking siderophile elements out of, the sidero, uh, out of the silicate shell. At some point, the planetary body is big enough and cool enough that that metal no longer falls through the mantle. And any siderophile elements added to the planet after core formation ceases ends up in the silicate shell and increases the concentrations of those elements. So if you like gold and platinum, you probably have this process to thank for them being in the silicate shell of the planet in sufficient quantities to mine and make stuff out of. And so if you have a portion of the mantle that has not yet had this late accreted stuff mixed in, which is conceivable still during early Earth history, like 3.9 billion years ago, you can just mathematically remove what the tungsten contribution to that material would be. And it moves it to the right on this figure. And so this was the interpretation of uh, this paper for the reason that you have positive offsets in the isotopic composition of early Earth rocks. I won't go into other interpretations for this. There are about uh, three other interpretations. The bottom line is, we don't agree on it. We're not sure. Nobody would bet their life on any of the four possible interpretations. This is just one of them. Instead, we're going to fast forward 3.7 billion years to today. And we're going to go to a nice pleasant location like Hanuma Bay on Oahu. Hawaii is an ocean island basalt system, or a hot spot. Some people uh, believe that uh, hot spots like the Hawaiian islands form as a result of rising plumes of material under the island chains. OK, so let's look at tungsten in modern rocks. And uh, the postdoc that I initially uh, employed to develop uh, this system at the University of Maryland, Mathieu Taboul, uh, generated some of the first uh, data for early Earth rocks. He also uh, went at uh, some modern rocks. So he analyzed some mid-ocean ridge basalts. 
He also analyzed kind of the ends of the tetrahedron that I showed you earlier in the talk. So he analyzed the type uh, locales for high mu basalts, enriched mantle one basalts, and enriched mantle two basalts. And he didn't find any anomalies at all. And so we were pretty much ready to abandon the search for tungsten anomalies in modern rocks, as most people have done with regard for the search for neodymium-142 anomalies in the same rocks. So we were about to just go back to looking at early Earth rocks. One of the people that we were working with said, ah, but you, know, you only looked at uh, certain kinds of rocks from uh, these locations. You might want to go back and look at a specific uh, geological or geochemical characteristic basalt from Samoa. Samoa being islands in the uh, South Pacific. And uh, indeed, uh, it turned out that uh, many of the rocks from Samoa and Hawaii and maybe even Iceland, shown in this diagram, have negative anomalies. And so uh, this is a plot of mu tungsten 182 versus nothing. Uh, the gray band here refers to the one or the two sigma standard deviation uncertainty of a single analysis of a standard. The darker gray in these figures refers to repeated analysis, the two standard error of standard analysis. And the um, error bars for the individual samples refer to the uh, expected uncertainty for a single analysis. So you can see that a number of these uh, basalts have negative anomalies. But uh, the most astounding thing about this, not just finding anomalies for a system that decayed away 4.5 billion years ago, uh, but the fact that these anomalies appear to correlate with a noble gas isotopic ratio. And the noble gas isotopic ratio here is helium 3 4 ratio. And so this is a plot of helium 3 4 normalized to atmospheric helium. The vertical scale in this case is mu-182 tungsten. You, by the way, plot somewhere around here. So you have a normal tungsten isotopic composition, and uh, your helium-3-4 ratio is roughly 6 to 8, something like that. You can see that some of the rocks from Hawaii and Samoa have both negative tungsten anomalies and excessively high helium 3-4 ratios compared to atmospheric. So we've long known that some ocean island basalt systems have high helium 3-4, but never before this uh, 2017 study done here did we uh, note a relation between uh, the tungsten isotope system and helium. Okay, so what does a correlation like this mean? In simple terms, it means that uh, we're probably dealing with at least two component mixing, something that we spend a lot of time dealing with in the world of geochemistry. Uh, so these uh, two components would each have distinctive helium and tungsten characteristics. Uh, one end member would, of course, have characteristics similar to you and me and the silicate world around us. The second end member, though, must be characterized by high helium 3-4 ratio and a low mu-182 tungsten value. So what does that mean? OK, so both helium-3 and helium-4 are isotopes of helium that have been produced through um, the history of the universe. So they are primordial isotopes. But helium-4 is also generated as a result of the decay process of mostly uranium and thorium. Um, and so if you have a lot of uranium and thorium around, you produce a lot of helium-4. And so to maintain a high helium-3-4 ratio somewhere in the Earth, first of all, you can't have that domain outgas. If you do, all of the helium-3 and helium-4 will go with it, and you'll end up just with helium-4 that's produced from the decay of uranium and thorium. So that won't give you a high helium-3-4 ratio. And uh, also, you can't have a domain in the silicate earth that is enriched in, helium and thor or enriched in uranium and thorium, because even if you retain all of the original helium-3, your ratio would decrease as a result of decay of having a lot of uranium and thorium around. 
So the interpretation of high helium 3-4 in uh, terrestrial rocks has typically been one of a primordial domain somewhere in the Earth that's never outgassed and has never seen appreciable enrichment by recycling of crustal materials. We've already uh, really seen where you get low mu-182 from. One place you get low mu-182 is in a metal that forms early. If you have a metal that forms early, it has no hafnium. It records the tungsten isotopic composition of the system at the time the metal is separated, and that'll be a negative mu value. One place we know we have a negative mu value is the core. Okay, the other option for a negative mu value is fractionation in a magma ocean, like we discussed for neodymium 142. So, the way to test for that is look at neodymium 142 in the same rocks that we see the tungsten anomalies in. We don't have a whole lot of data for that. This is the only published set of data that uh, we have both isotopic systems analyzed for both systems. And you don't see a positive correlation there. If anything, maybe you see a slight negative correlation, but there's no evidence of the positive correlation we would expect to see if this were the result of some sort of silicate fractionation event. Continuing on, just a few months ago, we published data for Iceland. I'm going to make this a little bit more complicated, but don't worry, we'll get through it. Uh, Iceland appears to show two trends. So the trend that I just showed you for Hawaii Samoa is outlined here. We have a similar trend for some basalts from Iceland. We have a secondary trend with a shallower slope also for Iceland. They're separated, surprisingly, by their long-lived uranium lead ratio systematics, which is reflected in a lead 206, lead 204 ratio. So I'm not going to go into an explanation of that. I don't think we have a particularly good explanation for that. Uh, but it does show that there is variability in the slopes of these helium tungsten correlations. So to make a long story kind of short, uh, these are all the data that we've accumulated by September of this year for Ocean Island basalt systems. It looks like it's biased towards negative values, but we've concentrated most of our analytical work on materials with high helium 3, 4 ratios. Most, the vast, vast majority of rocks on the surface of the Earth do not have high helium 3, 4, so don't get the impression that there's lots and lots of this stuff with negative anomalies arriving at the surface. If you go through this, maybe you recognize some of the names as being Ocean Islands, Tristan, uh, Galapagos. So these data are for um, Fernandina in the Galapagos archipelago, and so on. And in fact, uh, the Galapagos Islands define yet another trend. That would be this one. The Galapagos uh, Island trend has the steepest slope and the island of Fernandina in the Galapagos archipelago, which is a pretty young phenomenon, uh, has the lowest uh, tungsten anomalies of anything that we've measured so far to date. <clears throat> no, these are uh, from surface uh, flows. Um, So uh, we've had uh, some of these papers reviewed. Some of the reviewers don't like us calling these trends. I guess I would say if you don't like them being called trends, fine. Just ignore them as being trends. The really important thing to note here is uh, these kind of form a triangular, a triangular shaped uh, region, which from a geochemical standpoint requires at least three different uh, end member components of mixing to, to generate the variations that you see here. So for just the next few minutes, and then I'll finish up, let's just go through what, what these three end member components must look like, and then I will tell you where we think they're coming from inside the Earth. So number one is, is you and me, uh, perfectly normal stuff with normal helium and normal tungsten. We're calling that ambient mantle. Ambient mantle can be anything that produces materials that have normal helium and normal tungsten. 
it can include portions of the mantle that includes recycled materials, which can give you variations in those long-lived radiogenic isotope systems, hence the mantle zoo that I started out with. But by and large, recycling of stuff throughout Earth history will tend not to modify helium so much or tungsten uh, in most circumstances. So this, we think, is just kind of general run-of-the-mill mantle, and that's why we call it ambient mantle. The second one we're going to call primordial signature one. Uh, it lies out here. It's characterized by high helium 3-4 ratio. It's characterized by a tungsten isotopic composition that is not anomalous. Uh, we think it's there because we have some rocks from uh, West Greenland, some 60 million year old rocks from West Greenland uh, that plot out there. So they kind of define the minimum characteristics of this component. Again, uh, this portion of the mantle can include recycled components. These two systems are just immune to the effects of that. And then the most exciting one is component three, which uh, must plot somewhere down in this region. And it has high helium 3,4. It has a low mu tungsten 182 value. Again, it can include uh, recycled components. So then the question is, what is 2 and what is 3? I want to get it. Component 3 first. Uh, one obvious contender for what component 3 is, as I mentioned before, is the core. The core has a very low tungsten isotopic composition. It, uh, if it has any helium in it, the helium 3-4 ratio must be very high because it would record primordial helium without any uranium or thorium. And um, the kicker, though, would be if you're transferring metal directly from the core into some sort of a rising plume, uh, the core also has very high abundances of highly siderophile elements like gold, platinum, and iridium. We don't see excesses of gold, platinum, or iridium in the basalts that have high helium 3,4 and low tungsten. And so we don't believe there's a direct uh, metal contamination, core contamination into these uh, plume components. Instead, we think that the core signature is being driven through an equilibration process with a partially molten zone at the core mantle boundary, which I'll show you a little bit of seismic evidence for in just a second, which uh, would facilitate isotopic and elemental exchange between the core and the mantle. And so we would envision that as, I guess I can proceed by knocking the left one out. Uh, we would envision this as a process of equilibration between the metallic core and a uh, molten silicate region at the core mantle boundary, which would give us a strongly negative tungsten isotopic composition. It may give us a high helium 3,4. If it's a primordial component, we don't even need to get the helium from the core. It would just be recording the helium composition of uh, that portion of the Earth when it was isolated very early on. And because it's in equilibrium with the core, it would not have high, highly siderophile element abundances. So we view that as a more likely uh, provider of the uh, core signature in these ocean island basalts. And this is just a three-way mixing diagram. All I want to show in this is it doesn't take much of this component three, this equilibrated region of the, of the mantle with the core to give you the isotopic compositions that we see. And that's just an enlargement to show you that you really only need about 0.2% uh, or 0.3% of this equilibrated material to give you these uh, deviations from normal because the, the core, as you just saw, is uh, much more uh, depleted in tungsten 182 than the materials that we're seeing in ocean island basalt systems. Okay, this brings us to a topic that I know very little about, so I'll just stand here and tell you what I know. Uh, seismic tomography is a process uh, by which we use seismic uh, waves to uh, essentially uh, see into the mantle and look at the structure of the mantle. And uh, seismologists use mantle tomography to uh, see structures in the mantle that reflect either uh, compositional differences within the mantle, temperature differences within the mantle, or a combination of the two. 
to make uh, 40 years of mantle tomography and simplify it down to 30 words or less. Uh, one of the key discoveries in the last uh, 20 years has been uh, the discovery in the lower mantle of uh, regions that are characterized by very uh, low shear velocities. And uh, they are cleverly named large low shear velocity provinces in this cross-section diagram from uh, this 2008 paper, they're colored red. And there are two big LLSVPs, as they're known, one under Africa and one under the Pacific Ocean. And so uh, they're presumed to be more dense than the ambient mantle. They comprise as much as 8% of the Earth's mantle. And they lie below Hawaii, Samoa, Iceland, Pitcairn, Mangaia, and the Canary Islands. So they are are physically associated, or should say spatially associated, with many of the ocean island basalt systems that we're talking about. Associated with LLSVPs are volumetrically much less significant, but seismically more, in, even more interesting regions called ultra-low velocity zones. So these are little tiny portions of the lowermost mantle at the core mantle boundary. They're always at the edges of LLSVPs. And they're characterized by really low velocities. And uh, they're presumably more dense than LLSVPs. So it's presumed they have a higher iron content. And some investigators assume that they are still molten today. And there are three known mega ultra low velocity zones. And they lie beneath Samoa, Hawaii, and Iceland. So they're, again, spatially associated with some of the most isotopically interesting materials that we've looked at. So this is the uh, wild speculation part of the talk. Uh, we are making the conclusion that uh, the ambient mantle is our component one. I don't think anybody's going to argue with that. Uh, we speculate that component two, because of its size, is uh, the large low shear velocity provinces. And we speculate that uh, component three based on the uh, little bit of uh, spatial association that we have, uh, is the ultra-low velocity zones where the equilibration between the core and the lowermost mantle is occurring. So if you want a conceptual model, this is it. Uh, we would envision uh, exchange of tungsten and maybe helium at the base of the mantle, shown in a uh, molten region that uh, provides material to these ultra-low velocity zones. We presume that these uh, LLSVPs are characterized by high helium-3-4, meaning they probably formed early in Earth history, but after hafnium-182 had decayed away. And uh, most of the signature that we're getting in these ocean island basalt systems is ambient mantle. And so implications, and I'll finish up, there's evidence that uh, mantle domains formed really, really early in Earth history, within the first 50 million years of solar system history. Uh, some of those domains are recorded within at least Earth's earliest rock record. And the fact that some of them survive uh, to the present day suggests that uh, the Earth has uh, domains within its silicate shell that have never been mixed thoroughly throughout the silicate shell. And uh, again, we believe that the ultimate source of the tungsten that we're seeing in some of the ocean island basalt systems comes from the core. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. See, I told you it would be a bit different from what you usually hear. Question? I'm not a geologist or anything like that. I'm a biological oceanographer. But what explains the different trends that you're seeing in the Galapagos, the Hawaii? Is it because they're coming from different sources? No, they would, uh, in our model, they would uh, be incorporating different proportions of the uh, mixture between component two and component three. OK. So you get these curved mixing trends. The trends that I showed you are. Uh, really hypothetical because the concentrations of these elements, uh, particularly helium, are really hard to pin down for these hypothetical end-member compositions. But 
something like what I showed you, we believe is uh, reasonable to within one order of magnitude of, uh, of likely concentrations, and therefore the mixing curves are probably generally reasonable. Okay, and within a, an island, um, archipelago like the Galapagos or Hawaii, does that composition, the mixture of composition change from, say, um, Fernandina to the more east, southeastern islands in the Galapagos? Yeah, well, that's, um, that's what the trend is showing you, okay. that uh, the low helium 3, 4 end member of uh, the Galapagos, which is a wolf volcano, um, has normal helium and normal tungsten. And so we're looking at an array of materials ranging from normal to the high helium 3, 4 and uh, low tungsten isotopic composition. In a geochemical sense, you would expect mixing to produce curved trends. Mm -hmm. We don't have, unless the end members have exactly the same concentrations, that's very unlikely. Uh, but we don't have the resolution to see curvature in those. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, were you able to see, uh, so for example, with your, your tungsten uh, that you found, um, or your, your, you, you postulated being due to the quark, have you seen um, uh, for different types of uh, uh, non-radioactive sources that might correlate with these different, you have these different portions of this one, this, the tungsten being in the core, but then you have other areas where you think there's, uh, that you have other radioactive sources. Do you find correlations between like the presence of say other non-radioactive elements in the same, uh, area as what you found with the, your, uh, your, with the radioactive sources that you're, you're looking at? Yeah, we're, we've really been looking for them. We haven't found them. Um, so helium three, four, like I said, that's been known that there are high helium 3, 4 sources uh, for decades. Uh, helium 3, 4 has never correlated with anything else. Uh, this is really the first um, isotope system that uh, helium correlates with. Uh, so okay. people have been looking for trace element correlations with helium, again, for decades and not so seen. So why wouldn't it, why wouldn't they exist in the same presence of the other compositions that you'd expect in those different uh, areas? Well, I think in this case, um, one of the reasons is the uh, most isotopically um, different end member is being added in such a small proportion that uh, the chemical characteristics of that being added in just doesn't come into play. We don't have the resolution to see it. So yeah, you know, you would expect to see uh, Highly siderophile element abundances vary somewhat as a consequence of a component being added like that, but it's such a small percentage of the contribution to a basalt, let's say, in uh, Fernandina in the Galapagos that we can't resolve it. Got it. Probably there, but not at a level that we can see. Okay, so it's ramp up, <laughs> and thanks the speaker again. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. All right. Okay. Oh.